and we are live uh, namaste everybody hello dear friends how are you um, I'm back here again with a really exciting episode of Unlock Jam Room um, my guest today is an illustrious violin maestro she is the queen of Indian classical violin her name is Rishi Kala Ramnathji and uh, I'm really happy to announce that uh, Kala Ramnathji has actually never done um, an Instagram live before so this is a very special episode because such an illustrious maestro is coming live on Instagram for the first time and it is my privilege that she's coming on Instagram live with me um, I have many many things to say many fond memories, many fond experiences and a lot of collaborative work that we've done together and I see a lot of you joining in. Hello Anjali, hello uh, Aishi Mishraji, uh, hi to all of you, um, good evening from Kolkata and um, you know good morning to all of you in the States, good afternoon to everybody in Europe and wherever you are in the world. I'm really proud to have uh, Kala Ramnanji because not only is uh, she one of the greatest uh, musicians that I've uh, played with, um, worked with in various platforms, studied with, but uh, wonderful I see Kala Ramnanji has joined the live feed and she sent us a request. So please welcome Rilushi Kala Ramnath. But this is going to be a really, really exciting episode. Namaste, DB. How are you? How are you? I'm okay. Aap mera pranam dije. Bahut din ke baad aapke saath I'm uh, seeing you after a long time. Yes. We've been a long time. Played together also. Absolutely. So that needs to change. That we need to do something about that for sure. <laughs> hmm. Um, you are in uh, you are in San Francisco now. You you left yeah, over. Yeah. Came here three four uh, three days ago. Three days ago. So how was that journey? Please please tell us. The journey was uh, what do I say? Uh, I took air in, flew Air India. Oh, you flew Air India. Okay. Okay. And so. <laughs> the, the, I mean, it didn't have any uh, any or any exciting things happening in the plane. I'm Every sure. I with them. What the face shield. Oh my God. Oh and my God. With their face shield. And uh -huh. uh, 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 in the economy section, the uh, in the, um, the middle seat, uh, they were sitting with the whole PP kit. Oh my God. My God. Uh, that must be scary to even see. Like Yes. And in the business the business section, all of us were, we were given the mask and the face shield. But right. the first thing was, we didn't have food. You didn't have food? In the sense, they gave us snacks and all they did was they put a big bag of snacks on our seats. Okay. And that trip, so you cannot keep eating uh, 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 namkeen. Pretzels and namkeens, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then some cakes and some, oh, you cannot have that as lunch, right? No, of course, of course. But that's all because this is a long flight from Mumbai to uh, SF, right? Or uh, Oakland, where, where did you land? First part of they didn't have blankets for everybody. So it was quite cold inside the plane. And mm. everybody quietly, I couldn't say anything because they, we were, they were doing us a favor by, you know, ferrying yeah, yeah. us. Of course. Of course, we have a lot of really interesting people joining us today. Sabari Mishra has just joined and mm. uh, Anjali from New York. Various people from all over the world are joining us. Really interesting artists. Yeah, I'm I very proud that you've never done an Instagram live before. And uh, today, uh, I have oh, the privilege of having you. Uh, what do you say? Uh, made in uh, <laughs> Instagram live. <laughs> Instagram live, yes, absolutely. Your Instagram live debut. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So um, I, I want to say before anything else, before we start the actual interview, and I want to say this because I've said this many times to you, you know this, but um, a 
lot of people who are watching today they don't know because this is a very very uh, um, very personal thing of mine. I proudly share it, but I want to say it on a public platform so it remains on record. Vivi, you have been one of the most, uh, apart from being one of the greatest musicians that I've ever played with, I've ever heard. Um, all of that. Apart from that, in my life, your contribution to my career and to my musical journey is unparalleled. Unparalleled in the sense no one human being has done as much for me as you have. And um, I say this with uh, the most amount of... Uh, Uh, the most amount of resonance from my heart, my Shashtang pranam to you because so many things, so many things would not have been possible if it wasn't for you. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart and the depth of my soul. But I have to tell you, I am the person who did it. It was destined that you had to go through with me, a part of your journey with me. And it's for greatness. It's why you went, you know, went through what you went, and then mm -hmm. you know, I was just the person you met your journey who connected you with. People. Yes, but but you did that, right? You made see the things that I've been on this journey with so many people, but yeah. uh, today the fact that you know this is 2020 and this year is the 15th year that I have been studying with uh, Zakid. And uh, I remember the first day in 2005. We remember? Princeton. Yes, we went to Princeton and you told Zakirji that you have to teach him and you just made, who, nobody does that in today's age. Uh, you know, like nobody really does that. And I, you know that I was really struggling with uh, my teacher and mentor and that whole space of the guru and all that. But I am forever, for the rest of eternity, I'm indebted to you from what I have learned from him and how he has inspired me and motivated me and advised me over the years and how close I've become to him. But that first day in Princeton where he was, you remember he was reserving our parking spot by standing on the street yes. and waving his leg like that. That's an unforgettable experience. And that night I came home and I went insane because like... I remember you could not sleep that night. I'm telling I could you. not sleep. I was walking outside, coming back inside, going. I could not believe that this actually happened. And, you know, three days later, he called me to play at his Princeton house, the one that he had rented with Tony Lee. And all that happened. That is one chapter. The other thing is that the first time I actually played in Dover Lane was your first solo in Dover Lane. You know yes. that? I got really sick that day. And I, I you know. To do that again, unfortunately. <laughs> Must, oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely we should we should do that again and again and again because i mean i also remember very distinctly the first time i played with you which was uh in birmingham alabama alabama that day there was this uh what is it hurricane on that day i think yeah 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 there was supposed to be a huge hurricane and all of that stuff but the the beautiful thing is that that day I played with you, we didn't get a chance to rehearse or... No. We just... It's because I, uh, the Wi-Fi is not working really well. So I, I, I'm having to... So I'm, I apologize for that. Mm -hmm. So that day I, I realized that, you know, if two souls are connected, two human beings are connected at a human level, that connection also reflects in the music that they play together yeah. you know and uh it, it was amazing immediately we fell into place like you know like a ball and socket and incredible then apart from that i played about 70 odd concerts with uh, pandit jasaji again that is something that you uh facilitated and you kind of motivated so i don't i don't know i don't have words in any language to thank you really. like you have been we played with George Brooks here in the Bay Area. In, yes, absolutely. Absolutely, I remember. And that was right after the workshop, the, the Zakiji workshop in, the, in Merlin. Yeah. And what an experience that was. What an experience that was. So I will talk about all these experiences, but I um, first want to bring up 
the fact that you you are from a carnatic violin tradition from yeah. your family right so with one tm krishnan ji and dr rajan ji these people they are related to you they are your aunt and uncle and uh, your grandfather um, he, he, with one a narayan ayer ji he was also a, a carnatic musician so is that how your training started can you tell us a little bit about your initial training as a musician oh, i was my family start so i started exactly when i was two and a half years old oh my okay so we don't know what early training was only uh, imagine that probably i couldn't even sit for five minutes so maybe two minutes i'm sure the beginning sure. yeah and just play sare gama pa ghanta you know i think till i was four hmm. i was playing uh, too much it was all five hmm. Hmm? wow <laughs> Acha, I, didi, your audio is coming and going sometimes uh can you get a little closer to the phone sometimes it's cutting off okay if i get closer to the phone ah. i maybe i should talk like this yeah yeah this is better this is better, better. so yeah. um i really don't know what they started me on and hmm. what got me but i do know by the time i was 7 years old Is gone again. A diary for me. Oh wow! And I I put some pictures of it in my phone. Let me see if I can retrieve it. And that uh, time, at that time, he maintained a diary um, <laughs> of what what I used to play. And he also mentioned, uh, oh, she she had uh, chicken pox. She <laughs> so no practice. <laughs> This is all in the diary. Yeah, this he maintained the diary of my practice. My God! So what rags I did, Vilambit? What rags I did? So at seven years of age, I guess I didn't learn of Carnatic music very little, probably. Hmm. You know, hmm. um, because I uh, even the diary doesn't say anything about Carnatic music at all. Okay. So, but seen. Uh, I mean, in seven, seven, four, seventy-two, fifty-four. Hmm. Four of rap, and that is there. Uh, <laughs> okay, your audio is off again, Didi. I can't hear you. Contact. You, can you can you hear me clearly? I can hear you clearly. Clearly, can you hear me now? Yes, much better. Much better. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I did not. Uh, so I think uh, I learned a lot in that period, but I don't think I learned a lot of Carnatic music because it is all Hindustani rags only, which is there in the list. Hmm. Hmm. And I did Vilambit. So he would put a. Pointer, they're saying, oh, today she practiced Vilambit in this rag. This was a whole rag which was delineated and stuff like that. Wow, which rag was that? The I mean, any, any different uh, any rag. I'm just searching for that paper. If I could, uh, I clicked the picture of it and kept it with me. Hmm. Unfortunately, when you need something, you don't find it. Can't. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh. Okay. So, so here. Here he says, "Can you see?" There is a reflection of your window. Please read it out. So this page says, "Kala started violin in September 1969." Ah, so just after the summer of 69. Yes, and then <laughs> says February 1972. Hmm. Says Bhopali Durga Bhairav Malkons, and then exercises. So those are all painted on exterior, no? Yeah, Bhairav is not on. No, not Bhairav. Bhairav is six nine. Bhopali Durga and uh, Malkons. Of course. Then 
This is November 1974. Hmm. Look at the number of rags I have. Bhu, 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 Nursing home, it says. Those days I didn't practice. <laughs> and this is this is your grandfather keeping track of all of this stuff. Track of wow. everything. Wow, amazing. So, so the way you learned uh, the technique of the violin was yeah. that from your grandfather, and what is that process like? Because I know it's really difficult. It was all my grandfather. Hmm. The reason, uh, see, my grandfather was old when he was uh, over, around over 70 years old, I think, when I was born. Mm. Or rather, he was 70 years old when I was born. So he couldn't, uh, he didn't have, uh, I don't think he showed me much playing the violin. He mm. would, and I would, I would reproduce that on the violin. And then if I was making a mistake, he would tell me, use this finger, use this finger, and all those. And wow. then I, would do it okay so no uh, in your initial training nobody actually uh, physically showed you the techniques of bowing and you figured it out yourself? not much my grandfather would show me sitting here he would sing and he would show me use this finger use the do this this way mm -hmm. and yeah okay. the, the reason I ask is because violin is uh, technically in terms of technique uh, mm. finger technique one of the most difficult instruments to play in the world yeah okay it takes years for a violinist to even come close to playing in pitch yeah in pitch because yeah. it's such a small fret i mean yeah. fret board and there is no fret it has no frets right it's so it's just you know, a fraction of a millimeter of your finger going here and there the oh, pitch millimeter you just have to move your finger like hmm. if you're like this you just a little like this will change it exactly exactly you get so, your finger in the same place the hmm. pressure you put by moving your hand your hmm. wrist if the pressure is more it's going to be uh sharp if the pressure is less it's going to be flat flat the pressure has to be right for you to hit the pitch correct and and also, not only the pressure in the left hand, the pressure of your bow in the right hand and the movement, that also will, uh, uh, what is it, uh, will will be a consideration to know if you're going to be, uh, for, for your accuracy. My God. Okay, yeah, so this is what I was uh, asking. So how do you, if you're not actually formally taught what those techniques are, uh, how do you, my grandfather would say this whole phrase should be played in one bow or things like that. So then I know, but, and he also would always keep emphasizing that bow strong, don't bow light. Mm -hmm. And let your hand, um, because what people generally do is when they bow, they mm -hmm. bow. And then when they come towards the corner, this they, they do not bow strong. The pressure and, falls. They vary the pressure towards the end of the bows. The end, mm -hmm. end. And what, because thinking, if they use the same pressure, mm -hmm. there's a scratchy tone coming. Ah, yes. They do not realize that the scratchy tone comes because mm -hmm. you vary the pressure and the movement. If you maintain the movement and the pressure right, if both mm -hmm. are in sync, the sound mm -hmm. will come. It will be clear crystal clear so that means that if you're coming towards the end of uh, the bow oh. and you're holding it you have to keep adjusting the pressure because obviously because your hand is near it your no. pressure will be less that, no? you do not adjust you play as you play maintain the pressure and movement okay you learn how much of pressure you should give how much you should you give the hand the, uh, the um, you don't decide. Let the hand decide how much of pressure. Ah, ha, ha. Yeah, yeah. 
discover so because of that so you keep maintaining keep playing loud don't soften the keep going loud and keep moving what when they play with this hand their attention is here so then this hand does not move This, so, like in tabla, when you play with your left hand and then your right hand, your left hand is doing something and your right hand is doing something. Yeah, absolutely. So there is this disconnect here, the left brain and the right brain, right? The same sure. thing in in this also. Mm -hmm. Usually, when we lift something, we lift bo uh, with both hands. And the, yeah. yeah. that is not there so this hand moves at a certain tempo this mm. hand moves at a certain tempo so you could be playing a phrase where this is very fast but this is really slow right absolutely so when you try to synchronize both hands mm. that you land in problems because you sure. don't have, don't have bow space you so so to learn how to manage the bow using mm. the whole bow Mm -hmm. whether you play uh, one note or uh, 20 25 notes that mm -hmm. comes only with practice of course and the practice is movement and pressure uh -huh. in this hand yeah balance between these two things yeah uh, i have to say that you know your your bowing technique is yeah Oh, commendable because uh, in in your repertoire, the way you play, you yes. actually have phrases in the jhala section when you're usually playing. You yeah. have a single bow technique where you hold a note for like almost thirty forty seconds or something like this. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It sounds like one thing. It sounds like a drone. Yes. Know? So developing yeah. that bow technique. I mean, if uh, any of violinists are watching, you must you must uh, check out her bowing technique. So, is there any? Uh, difference between the way you use the bow and the way western violinists would use the bow uh um hold oh, can you just say one minute <laughs> I, yeah so the thing is i use the bow uh i use the i use western techniques there so there's mm. a called spiccato spiccato yeah that's what i do. so when so i bounce. yeah it, the bouncing of the bow and hmm. move slowly move, 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 move. so there is one point in the bow where it really bounces so yeah you, and all different western techniques i try to play that in uh, in our music hmm. and for our music sure wow and that, that is that is actually it gives an unprecedented uh, amount of stability to the sound that you're producing which mm. is what makes you stand out uh, as a violinist as opposed to many other the, indian the, the violin the instrument itself is so good like i can even reproduce rhythm in it if you have heard uh, american country music on of the violin course. so they technique you know like on in the edge of the bow cha -cha. yeah, yeah. The slanted chopping on the chop, the chop. You use, and you have three, four violins. You can create a rhythm there, and you can play. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's one of the richest, absolute richest instruments in in the gamut of instruments all over the world. Yes. So this brings me to the question of your journey and your meeting. Uh, and the entry of Pandit Jasaraji in your life. How did that happen? And uh, that so is... just to have Zagir Bhai own way. Huh. A mentor, I think your guru is my mentor. Hmm. So when I asked my father, he came. He came to pay his condolences. Hmm. Then he heard my violin, and then he said. Uh, why would I listen to an imitation when I? You heard it? No, sorry. Say that again. I keep getting so, this. So, uh... as you have Zakir Bhai as your guru, I have him as my mentor. 
so when i lost my father in my childhood he had come to pay his condolences and then he heard me play the violin and then he said uh, why would i want to listen to an imitation when i can listen to the original he said i don't know what you do you are welcome to come to bombay stay in simla house and figure out your life but i was in, uh, still in school then mm-hmm. so i did not go but what he said stuck to uh, stuck in my mind and at time, i had just played my first concert uh, with sangeeta my cousin right sangeeta shankar ji the duet so that that concert was arranged by pandit jasraj so my first concert which i played it was arranged by him so so and i stayed where was that, hmm? where was that concert bombay in bombay okay so then uh, i knew him very well mm-hmm. called him called him mama ji mama right right so then after i finished college so till college i was just there in bombay in chennai you know mm-hmm. then i asked him if he would accept me and teach me uh, accept me as a disciple and luckily he agreed so my training with him started with traveling to concerts and accompanying him on the violin because i was technically i was good to accompany mm-hmm. but i wanted to do something different right right of course so then i started learning and uh, about 6 months i put myself through some rigorous practice of uh, i would sleep around 4 to 5 hours and all the time i'd be with music and uh, yeah then i had a radio uh, national program so i i coincidentally was in his house that day so i mentioned uh, you know my national program is coming then he he immediately asked for the radio and it was dinner time so and then they all listened to it and he was so happy and he said oh my god you've changed your playing completely so that made me happy and and of course after that i accompanied him many years he he took me to most of the places abroad wherever he went i was traveling as his accompanist on the violin so yeah that helped me that i mean probably i would say established me in mm. my absolutely um so what prompted you to what made you think of asking pandit ji pandit jasraj ji to teach mm. you like as opposed to going to a violin teacher or a I, violin i tell you why because one i i was playing like my aunt my aunt plays the gaikian right she right. has learned with omkar nath thakur right of course rajam ji yes and secondly uh, when i was a child my grandfather used to play me uh, vidushi kishori amunkar's recordings and pandit jasraj ji's recordings okay and I, basically he would play it from the radio you had that anuranjani happening at 340 right. 315 so i have heard bageshri and uh, bhup of uh, and kishori uh, um, ji john puri and pat bihag of kishori ji yeah yeah and aaj sana jaye and all those bandishri uh, yeah. then uh, pandit jasraj ji i would listen to shuddha sarang and bandishri as bilas khani todi and gorak kalyan and all these mm-hmm. rags mm-hmm. so i used to think his music was so beautiful this is what i wanted to do right right this felt that the music was so ornamentative and so pretty yeah yeah absolutely absolutely uh, pair it with other uh, like agra gharana that so can you know right right what what do you say it it's void of any ornamentations i would say yeah it's very uh, it's very raw in its uh, approach very yeah raw. whereas this one was very very nice yeah yeah i mean this was but, so beautiful like 
it made you feel so happy listening to that right yeah. hypnotic for the this music is yeah. hypnotic but it, you could go back and listen to it again and again absolutely and i got the opportunity to meet him and then uh, when i could when i i must i just mustered the courage up to ask him will you that's it yes he's a he's not an easy man to approach generally you know? yeah <laughs> so it takes courage to go up to him and say something like i know yeah. that for so i asked him and he agreed and that i consider that you know as one of the high points in my life that he accepted me as his disciple absolutely absolutely so uh, apart from the fact that you were accompanying him as a violinist in his concerts uh did he actually what was the process of because you play a pure khayal style you play vilambit ektal then you play a madhyalay bandesh or uh, you know uh, yeah or jud bandesh then sometimes you go into a tarana or you go into an ati jud bandesh so you play his repertoire when you play yeah. you're playing like, basically you've transcribed pandit jasradi onto the violin yeah so how did i mean did that happen just from accompanying him or did he actually sit and teach you the repertoire and the bandeshes and uh, uh to tell you the truth uh, most of it happened while traveling with him or while sitting for dinner or yeah. lunch or in the cab <coughs> he would teach me a lot at that time you know like in the train uh, in the right. cab so we would go to these places like amravati you know you know in maharashtra places where you cannot go by uh, this thing uh, by the plane so no. you either have to drive or you have to go by by train so yeah yes that is uh, fantastic and this is something that has happened so many times in spite it of doing workshops and classes with zaki ji yeah i have learned I'm, so much from having her with me it's the huh. same he would have also taught you like that right absolutely absolutely i remember after the uh, second time were you there with us the in 2007 you were there in the workshop with us right mm. in uh, the time that you played with him and yeah. he played harmonium with everybody uh, whoever played solo yes <laughs> so uh, at that at the end day the last day of the workshop we went to an italian restaurant after yeah. the workshop <laughs> you went with us right yes right so uh, we were there tony ji anisa all of them were there and uh, i was sitting in this corner with zaki ji on the opposite side and manjul you remember manjul from new jersey Man- of course i remember manjul bhagat so we were sitting there and over the dinner table he told me mm-hmm. that you know you are using i've noticed that you are using your entire finger ah. the whole of your finger to play na or ta uh, uh. yeah he was like well maybe you should try playing with the tip instead of the whole finger that way what happens is mass into area is pressure so if you minimize the area and the same mass is being applied your pressure will go up your sound will go up and this is something he said over dinner having pasta and all that and he didn't he just showed me on the table like this he was like you know just place it like this I went back to the hotel room that day, and I started playing. And my life changed. My entire playing, my sound, everything changed overnight because of that one thing that he said on the dinner table. And this is the very first stroke that you learn on the tabla. And I was already in my thirties at that point, or you know, late twenties. And he he just showed me a whole different way of playing the very basic stroke on the tabla. And he said that it's a. a Anubrata bhai is saying Zee Ji is a genius. Of course, he's a genius. Absolutely, there's no doubt. Um, the whole thing and this, huh? I'm saying Bubu, hello. <laughs> oh, Bubu, hello, hello, Bubu. Please stay with us. So, you know that that is such a revelation. And he said this to me because he and he still teaches me like that. He asks me, why do you do this? Why do you do that? And I have to explain to him why I'm doing it. and when i ask him am i doing something wrong he was like no there's no right and wrong i'm trying to see how we can maximize the output from your hand from your technique because everybody is different everybody's uh uh you know approach is different hand is different the way you think about it is different uh, anubhuta ji says hello kala ji uh 
So what you're saying, hire people. So, uh, yeah, I mean, traveling with these people, spending time with these people, uh, just having conversations with these people, you learn so much. You learn so much. Exactly. It is just not learning just music. So no, it's life. Life it's itself. Exactly. I have yeah. so many experiences and instances like that. Watching Please share how some. They, share some. Like uh, uh, Pandit Jasrat Ji, uh, you know, he's very insistent on, you know, having uh, his clothes ironed and, you know, wearing good clothes and being very presentable. And, sure. and I would wonder why so much on clothes and why this importance. Then one day he told me, you, the first impression is the best impression. The way people look at you right. first. They don't look at how you are from inside. They just look at their people. Sure. What inside? And, you know, for even, he would be so picky about even a suitcase. Yeah, yeah, I know. He would say, oh, this suitcase is really bad looking with so much of stickers on it. No, you need to get a better suitcase. I said, but they just it's just been a year since I got it and it has so many <laughs> stickers. He used you know, to have impeccable suitcases. I've seen his suitcases. I mean, yeah. you know, remember, I don't, when he came to my uh, uh, Tampa, when I was teaching there, uh, yeah. I dropped him to the airport and he was in his dhoti and his kurta and his jacket with a roller suitcase. And he walked into the, I've never seen such a smart guy, you know, like so like dashing and his personality is so magnetic and his suitcase is impeccable no fragile stickers nothing i mean like yeah. clean suitcase. clean so so he would hate it all he said, you cannot take these out you have to carry this everywhere and uh, yeah so he was like that and so if my uh, suitcase had any stickers he'd say get it out as right now you know, you know keep it clean and so that was one thing i learned and then the art of talking to people, the art of me, how he, uh, how he interacted mm. with, you know, Absolutely. that lesson to me, like how with organizers, with, uh, with uh, uh, people who are just his fans. Mm -hmm. it was, it was the, uh, you know, it, it spoke to me. And told me a lot about how I should behave in future and how mm. I should be students. Absolutely. I mean, with these these great uh, men, I, I, the things that they teach you how to lead the life of a musician, not just yeah. the music itself, you know, like, because, you know, music being like all these great men have said, it's not a profession, it's not a yeah. hobby, it's a life, it's a kind of life, you know. So uh, musicians are a certain kind of people. We are a category of human beings and we are different and we are weird and all of that stuff. And uh, yeah. No, we are weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have weird problems. We have weird desires. We have, you know, we're just weirdos. Like, and uh, the thing is that, so these people teach us how to live that life, how to be that person, you know, how to, to embrace that uh that special part of you because you, you know like uh, Daniel Barenboim said that music chooses to flow through you you don't choose music music chooses to flow through you yeah right it's music's choice and your only job is to not get in the way yes that's your and so uh, we hardly ever get to that point where we can stop uh, the flow from happening you know but these people help us towards that these people push us towards uh, becoming that person, you know. Um, I wanted to ask you one thing about, uh, I had seen years ago, um, you had performed a duet with Sanjeev Abankar in Dover Lane. Yeah. That is actually like the first time I met you and that time you didn't know me. I was like a fan. Okay. I came up to you and I spoke to you and all of that. And uh, so what was that like? Is, is well, I don't remember. Was that like a Jasrangi Jugalbandi or where... Um, was that like a plain duet? That was just a plain duet. No Jasrangi Jugalbandi. Okay. Jasrangi Jugalbandi is when you have two musicians, two singers singing yeah. 
different pitches. Different pitches, yeah, and transposed scale. I played in a Jasrangi Jugalbandi concert also with Tripti yeah. and uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, okay, that is a wonderful thing. Um, now the other part that I wanted to come to is that you have received the Sangeet Natak Academy Award, right? So how has that affected? Can you tell me about that experience and how has that affected your career, your life? Because that is a big deal. <laughs> I have to tell you a joke. So yes. when I got award, I was here in the US. So oh, let me start with how the award happened. So they called me at 4 a.m. in the morning. Okay, okay. And then I, I'm like, uh, how do I know this is true? So they said, you check your email. We've sent you an email. So I read. And then I couldn't believe that I got it. So I, I asked Sh Shekhar Sen, Shekhar Da, uh, hmm. you won't take it back, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, what do you mean? No, I said I have to put it on Facebook. <laughs> this is real, right? <laughs> <laughs> what if you put it on Facebook and then you say, no, no, it's not for you, it is a mistake. <laughs> Weird disaster! Oh my God! So oh. it was a big surprise, and then mm -hmm. I was so excited. I I sent a message to Zakir Bhai saying, Zakir Bhai, it seems I have won the uh, Sanginata Academy Award. Then he said, Oh, welcome to the club of elder musicians. You <laughs> see, absolutely. You have you graduated. You have arrived. You know, like, <laughs> Club of elder musicians, and I thought that was yeah, funny. <laughs> so, how how is that eventually? How did that affect your, uh, you know, because these are accolades. These are uh, let me tell you, books. nothing nothing has changed. It's still the same. Uh, you know, I just go play my concerts and come back. Uh, it's good to have got gotten the award and. Mm. At a good time. No, but I'm saying, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that it would have changed you as a musician or your musicianship. I'm saying change in terms of opportunities or the fact that, you know, people, it doesn't, it really doesn't make a difference. It doesn't make a difference. All these awards don't make a difference. It's just that when they announce, uh, then they say, oh, there she's, then people sit up and say, oh, she's got this, that's it. Hmm. It doesn't make a difference with the organizer. <laughs> if I have to say it truthfully. <laughs> right, right. No, this is amazing insight because like, yeah. I have to uh, tell you that, you know, when once I got the national award for uh, my film composition, it, it did give rise to certain opportunities. It did give, you know, like certain people were more inclined towards working with me. And yeah, uh, I'm not saying that people work with me only because I got the award, but the minute they realize that I have that uh, credential, they feel like, okay, there must be something that he does, which is, you know. So I just feel like it gave me a few opportunities which I may not have uh, ordinarily uh, had. I guess the classical community is so small, right? So, mm. and I... I was playing and generally there's a good opinion about my music and uh, it's not that people, <laughs> people thought that uh, oh she's not good and therefore getting this award made them change their mind about me. No, it wasn't like that. No, no, no. Okay, that's so, very insightful. Very insightful. So, uh, I don't think it made a big difference. Only mm. thing, yeah, I got this award and uh, okay, I'm in the elder community now. <laughs> in the elder community. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to tell you one difference that the National Award made in my life is that the minute I got that, people were like, oh, what's that? He's a film composer now. He doesn't play tabla. So they yeah. stopped hiring altogether, you know? Like, <laughs> it was just like they thought I shifted my career. And I was like, no, 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 I still play. I still play. Please, please. <laughs> Don't say that. You know, I'm sorry I got the National Award. I apologize. You know? <laughs> <laughs> please take me. So, um, I, I, Didi, I wanted to talk a little bit about your collaborations. You have had amazing, an amazing line of collaborations. You've worked with the Chronos Quartet. Mm. 
So tell me about that. I mean, Cronin Quartet is possibly the big, most widely known and well-respected string quartets in the world. I mean, they've played Requiem for a Dream. They've played Foley Room. They've done such gigantic work. How was that experience? Uh, so basically, um, when the Cronos decided to create a repertoire for uh, quartets, hmm. uh, they collaborated with Carnegie Hall. Ah. And uh, David Harrington from the Kronos, he called me and he said, uh, would like you to write a composition for, for, uh, for, for, uh, it's called 50 for the future. 50 for the future, right. right. So he said, I've got Zakir Bhai, and I've got your aunt, I want you also in it. My so God. So I said, uh, so then I wrote a composition for them. Played by many, many quartets, and it's always there on my Twitter and Insta that they performed here. They performed there, and my, my, my name does keep featuring. So I think they like the composition. That's all I can say. I'm sure. Wow. Wow. So you didn't actually, you wrote the composition for them. I mean, what, was the, what kind of a composition was this, like in terms of uh, the music of it? Indian music. It was Indian music. It was Indian it was a composition uh, based on Indian music. Like I used Tilakamo then Shuddhanat, two rags, a combination of two rags, and I wrote a composition. And uh, of course, I did not arrange it. So I wrote for, you know, there are four players in a quartet, right? So I wrote three parts for each of them. Hmm. Then uh, there's a lady. What is her name? Rina from uh, Los Angeles. I mm -hmm. forget her full name. She arranged the uh, the composition for them. Okay, so she arranged it for a quartet performance. For like yes. Four. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So okay. Four parts. One, ah. one the main violin, then the second violin, then the uh, cello and the viola. So I wrote four different parts, keeping in mind their uh, the pitches of right. each of them. Of course. Yeah. So were there uh, changes in the in the in the scale, as in like modulation, in terms of um, how Western music is? Because they are not used to playing in one sa. I, I, seen with various orchestras, they have a problem with the fact that we play a full concert in C-sharp or in D, you know. What so, was that? C-sharp, but like I, when I was writing for uh, the cello, I did hmm. it in a register. In the lower octave or a lower note? I, I wrote it in D huh. and the, the violins would play it in D hmm. and they would even go up to the higher octave. Hmm. The violas also would play it in D, hmm. Hmm? but come down, uh, you know, below D and to D, something like that. And uh, the cello would be totally at uh, and the lower octave completely. Right, right. That's how I wrote it. Oh. And they would yeah. all back to the same uh, uh, what is a sign line? Right, okay. So there's one pin melody or uh, yeah, kind of like a... Yeah, which mm -hmm. all the four would play and then each one would go off playing their own and then come back to the sign line. Signature, right. And were there harmonies or involved or are they playing in unison when they're playing? Yes, they were. They were. They so, were. so what Rina did was she sat with me and mm -hmm. uh, she asked me if the if one person is doing this, what do you think the other can, other person can do? So then I I played parts which she could use mm -hmm. them all together. So you collaborated on the arrangement. It's not like somebody else arranged it for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I probably did. Yeah. You composed for the Cronin Quartet, really? Like that? That to me is like, you know, because. I don't... I I thought it's for all quartets. Right, but still, I mean, they play it, right? They did. Yeah. 
because like one of my favorite uh, pieces i i think you've heard this piece i must have sent it to you it was called uh, requiem for a pillana i have a composition called requiem for a pillana which is based on the theme from requiem for a dream which is recorded by chronos quartet and uh, the whole thing is based in three notes so i'm a huge huge fan of of, of their work you know um the other thing i wanted to ask you is your experiences in working in hollywood because uh, you've uh, played in the soundtrack for blood diamond which is starring leonardo dicaprio russell crowe jennifer connelly all the super star studded uh, kind of things so what was that like and how did that happen uh i think uh, you know i was i i had performed in uh, montreal hmm. and uh, the, when i performed there at the world music festival there there was an uh, there was an iranian uh, band thing which who uh, you, uh, who had come to perform mm. so they heard me and then uh, when they they lived in los angeles so uh, maybe after 10 years after that concert mm. they got in touch with me and said they have a um, years yeah they have a um, what is it art gallery in los angeles in bo- hmm. in and they wanted me to come and play in the gallery okay i'm going to do playing in the gallery so they said trust me it will be there you'll you'll benefit from it i said okay hmm. you then so i'll come and play so i played there and uh, luckily for me the music producer of uh, uh, blood diamond there so he heard me and he couldn't he was so emotionally overwhelmed and he just said give me your email like you not talk to you right now and then <laughs> that happens when i listen to you also so the next day he emailed me saying my life is changed and this and that and he said uh, we would like to have you play for this mm-hmm. film and and so it happened <laughs> So what was that experience like do you play like in a score in theater or do you see the picture yeah. you were... so i played uh, so in what they did was first they played the rushes for me where i had to play hmm. and uh, they gave me some chords and they said do whatever you want in this chord in these hmm. chords hmm. so those chords i translated to our rags right right of course <laughs> and then i did something slow i did something like in medium tempo and then very fast tempo and everything hmm. and they recorded a lot from me like that with different different uh, what do you say uh, chords hmm. Hmm. so and then they said thank you and i said thank you and that's it <laughs> you didn't say you're welcome you said thank you also this is like one of my aunts who says i say i wish her happy birthday she says yes yes happy birthday happy birthday she also wishes me happy birthday you <laughs> know um but okay so we wish for the like i've seen blood diamond multiple times and i'm a huge leonardo dicaprio fan uh which for the scene it was a very violent movie you seen the movie right i really do not know where they have had but i do know there's some solo parts with cap Di- dicaprio when he's in his room or something i've heard it and also during during the fight scenes not fight scenes the where they run and everything chasing chase scenes yeah wow i would i would expect there to be stuff when you know he comes together with uh, jennifer connelly or he he gets betrayed by russell crowe and all that exact so they they did they recorded all those things but i don't know where they put what they did i have no idea See- I did see the movie and I I don't remember right now it was a long time ago. <laughs> okay. So I was by premiere and then I went to I was in India so mm. we I went to the to uh, uh, theater where it was being the first premiere was happening mm. and seeing the crowd there I came back home why because it was, I mean it was a mess out there so many people and my mother was pretty pissed off <laughs> she said i'll never go anywhere with you like <laughs> wow 
play it's a hollywood premiere that's what it's like exactly and i didn't know many people there and i after a few and you you know me right i'm not uh, I, i'm kind of a recluse i live like that i'm just mm-hmm. myself and me and my music i don't go out much i don't uh, socialize much so when i saw people i got scared <laughs> but you know you would have met leonardo dicaprio there right i know i don't even know if he was there because i saw that crowd and i said oh my god where am i i don't know anybody here and, and but that's why the crowd was there because all these stars will be there right you know what I mean? but i didn't know whom to talk to whom to get in touch with everything uh, though i had the interview uh, invitation in my hand and i was allowed inside but i did i it was such a <laughs> i get over this can make the uh, what do you say i tend to get in touch with people who could have helped me it mm. was so crowded like mm. i said, oh my god this is i i, I think i may get or get suffocated i have to get out of here my mother kept yelling at me all through the way back home she said you are fit for nothing you cannot do anything and <laughs> and i had my brother with me and my brother supported me saying come let's go home we can watch the movie later so yeah. didi going to a premiere is not about watching the movie you know that right <laughs> but i didn't have anybody my brother was also siding me right so i thought i'm doing the right thing yeah i should go back home <laughs> and oh only God. be there and see hmm. so pretty pissed off with me <laughs> wow you need to tell us about miles from india and your uh, grammy awards nomination which is another huge feather in the cap uh i don't know but i it's you know i i think i was just at the right place at the right time i get, i got called for, by uh, louis banks to record and mm. i i was just coming back from the airport and uh, from calcutta i reached bombay and they whisked me off to the studio from the airport mm. and recorded it i didn't know for whom i was recording what i was doing i just recorded it and then the next thing i know is uh, the film uh, sorry the album was uh, nominated for the grammys okay so this was a collaborative album with uh, louis banks and all these louis banks shankar mahadevan uh, uh-huh. you shrinivas was there uh-huh. then, yeah so a lot of people wow, From- wow. um <clears throat> and the other thing i want to ask you is that you have played in so many different venues all over the world you've played at the carnegie hall you've played at the royal elizabeth hall the sydney opera house you've uh, what has been your experience and tell us a little bit about the difference you felt in playing in such amazing venues or generally playing in venues outside the country as opposed to playing here in india and in terms of the audience also in terms of the technology the audience the quality of the uh, auditoriums themselves everything the experience uh see when i play in general see it's uh, when i was young my one of my first concerts in bombay was at uh, an auditorium which could house a thousand people okay and it was a big shock for me when i had only 15 people in the audience Fifteen. So, yeah, one five. So I was very very young and I was disheartened by what uh, seeing what, and uh, there was this uh, you know uh, critic, music critic Mohan Nadkarni. Mm-hmm. So he the concert, and he said, "Oh, Kala, give your best. It doesn't matter if there is fifteen or a thousand." The only thing that matters is you do your best and leave it to the almighty who knows in this 15 people there might be somebody who might help you with your career sure up sure. to into you so irrespective of the venue irrespective of how many people are there irrespective of anything else when you perform 
give you a hundred percent to it. So, so that stayed with me, and that's what I do wherever I go. I just play. About an hour, actually. Yeah, it's more yeah. than an hour since we've been chatting. So. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But I wanted to very quickly uh, fin- finish this. Uh, uh thing the other two things i wanted to talk about one is your your collaborations with the orchestral uh symphonies like the london symphony and the london philharmonic orchestra what was that like i mean um it's all the same as i said uh, you know being at the right place at the right time and hmm. uh, uh i think because of my uh, the way i play the violin and violin being a western instrument though i would say the ancestors of the violin are from india but uh, because we play better than anybody <laughs> yeah. so because of that and they feel it's this the tone the sound is unique so yes. and it's a, it's an instrument which everybody relates to in the west yes so exactly. so i got the opportunity to work with orchestras too mm-hmm. yeah and london symphony london philharmonic so i wrote a concerto uh, f- f- uh, called the indian seasons so india seasons so for each season uh, uh, the rags corresponding to that season i used right right and I, so that was premiered with uh, these uh, hague philharmonic L- london philharmonic and then london wow. symphony london symphony wrote a composition they had a, a composer write a composition which i played with them okay yeah. and how do you how do you collaborate like when you write a composition for a symphony uh who uh, what is the arrangement situation like like who orchestrates it and how is that done as i said i only play the i only write the composition and i send it to them and okay. then uh, They, then uh, there's an arranger who sits with me and works with me like so it's the same process like uh, like same. what yeah like for for the london symphony the composer ro- uh, came to india hmm. and uh, he sa- he was with me for a week recording hmm. portions of my playing okay okay and then took it back and then wrote a composition with that wow and wow. then he uh left about 40 bars for me to solo in between so you had to solo exactly in 40 bars and this is for a live performance yes so you've actually sat with the london symphony had a conductor cue you in and uh, yes. because you read uh, stuff uh, western notation oh, i do not right so you would have to go by listening to parts and remembering exactly. it exactly exactly and you soloed so, for 40 bars and I, you got the, the part started which means i uh, i it's time for me to end and right. uh, yeah so, so i had cue- the conductor cues you in and you uh, go with that or how do you, how what is the process that you followed he cues me in and then i hear uh, yeah, i had two rehearsals and in those two rehearsals i mentally made a note as to where the uh, 36th bar or 37th bar was coming in and mm. what instrument was playing there and what was being played so once i had that in my mind i could do whatever i wanted and once i knew i still have four bars now it's time to end and playing four bars on on beat wasn't a problem right i don't know of course yeah. and so what what the, you know, i'm just curious to know like because you're an indian violinist soloist and yeah. you playing with the orchestra what was the arrangement of the orchestra because because it do, doesn't that restrict your freedom in terms of the notes you can use you are right so what i did was uh when the orchestra was playing i was hearing the chords that was going behind me mm-hmm. so I, my improvisation on that right but so one on one level i was hearing the orchestra and mm-hmm. basing my improvisation on their on the chords that they were playing and they mm-hmm. were this with the sh- with every shift i was also shifting right right and then uh, towards the end when i heard, so this was happening at one na- on at one level and the other level was 
when uh, at, at around the 36th bar or something i when i heard that other instrument i knew now it's time for me to wind up right <laughs> yeah wow. but isn't as an indian soloist uh, were there uh, isn't that a little restricting for you to solo on something that is a pre given structure i don't because there, there's so many things you can do right it's true yeah of course i mean like when you play the tabla you could you could have done this you could have done that and there's still so much more to explore sure so, sure every time yeah every time. so wow that is uh, wonderful so i i have a, a little uh, rapid fire kind of round that i do in my <laughs> interviews uh, okay. i will give you a set i give you a set of choices and um you tell me the first thing that comes to your mind and after that didi i want to hear you play okay and, uh, but all of us want to hear you play there are several people who is uh, who are joining in now and from everywhere uh, fernando is joining in from miami and mm. uh, all these people so um i i just wanted to say that uh, and my mom has made a special request for you to sing a little bit okay because you're also an amazing singer and i remember um the first time we played in dover lady you actually sang that day right you sang the bandesh that day Okay. Right, yeah. right. Hello, Fernando. Nice to see you here. So, uh, shall we start with the uh, the rapid fire? <coughs> sure. <coughs> okay. Um, South Indian food or North Indian food? Both. Okay, that's not fair. You can't say that. <laughs> 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 Then the uh, point is. Gone. I think uh, I really like both. I'm a foodie. you can't right. select from two because i like i can't say this is no if you had asked me indian or some other thai or chinese then i would have said indian indian right no purposely i didn't ask you that because i know what your answer will be we've had several meals together i know where this is <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> okay uh, san francisco or mumbai uh san francisco yeah Wow, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, San Francisco is also one of my favorite cities in the world. I mean, like it's mm. incredible that place is just. See, both uh, places have their, you know. Charm, yes, of course. Yeah, Absolutely. but uh, uh, I think I like uh, that I can go around here, especially now in the lockdown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like having to sit inside the house locked up. No, absolutely, absolutely. That's the problem. Please be safe. Don't go out too much, huh? But yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, two favorite violinists from India mm-hmm. of the senior generation. Uh, one is my aunt Raja. Of course. The other one is my uncle Krishnan. <laughs> of course. <laughs> my auntie and my uncle. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, two favorite violinists of the next generation. The next generation, I don't see too many violinists right now. Hmm. hmm. Yeah. They still have to work their way up for me to pick them. Okay. I don't. I don't talking don't about the generation after you. Yeah, after me. That's what I'm talking about. Right. 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 They need to work. They just need to work a bit more. Okay. that uh, tells us something so all the violinists who are listening please get on your game so that kala ji can pick you the next time i talk her okay um two favorite uh violinists from and it, it doesn't have to be uh you know hindustani classical it can yep. be carnatic of your generation apart from you of course uh mean from india or uh, all over the world what are you india talking? india yeah i think i like uh, dr l subramaniam i like hmm. then, then it's of my generation you're talking of of? yeah yeah uh, ganesh parish they good right absolutely absolutely um okay and two violinists who are non indian violinists not indian uh hilary han Kilian of course of course then 
Joshua Bell. Joshua Bell. I knew you were going to say that. I just knew it. <laughs> Wonderful. So basically, classical uh, violinists. Okay. And anybody from any other genre, like fiddle violinists or gypsy or uh, jazz? Uh, fiddle violinists, I know quite a few people. Uh, mm. What's her name? There's Jeremy Kittle. Jeremy Kittle, yes. Is that right? Right. Um, okay, and the uh, the last question is Hollywood or Bollywood? Uh, not both. Okay, this is like the North Indian South Indian food thing. Okay. <laughs> um, you ask me. Uh, you are asking me with, with reference to music, or you are asking me generally? Do, do I watch ev- Hollywood? Everything watching or your experience in working or you know from any perspective that you like uh, I haven't worked in Bollywood at all I, ever no not at all ever no. that's okay but, you work in Bollywood no big deal yes <laughs> then I only know about one right okay okay so as a as a viewer as somebody who's watching movies which one would be your Bollywood <laughs> There we go. One thing didn't that I forgot to ask you is about your interaction. And thank you, Fernando, for reminding me. This was on my list, but I completely skipped it. Your interaction and your collaboration with Ray Manzarek. Ray Manzarek, uh, I was in Los Angeles, and that was my first collaboration uh, with wow. the. For those of who are joining us right now, Ray Manzarek is uh, the keyboardist and one of the prime arrangers for The Doors with uh, Jim Morrison. So he's a legend. Founding member of the, the founding member of the, of the doors, yes, of course. So please so, tell us about that. Yeah, I, I was like I was really young, twenty four, twenty five years old, and I had uh, uh, I had come to Los Angeles to work with some uh, with the Aurobindo Center. Okay. So huh. one of Michael, 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 I forget his name. Um, he had taken me to meet Ray Manzarek. Wow. Yeah, that's how, because he was a good friend of Ray. Mm. He said you should share with Ray and that's how it happened. And what was the experience like? Like, what did you... Uh, we picked the composition of uh, The Doors, The Indian Summer. The Indian Summer, yes, of course. And we worked on that and <laughs> See, basically because of, um, I wouldn't say it's my brilliance, I would say it's because of our training in Indian mm. music, where we uh, we hear tones, right? We, uh, we do not read, we hear it. Right. So our mind immediately starts translating everything into uh, uh, scales. Right. So my mind immediately started translating and I could immediately improvise because... We are used to those scales, impro- improvising in those all these scales, right? Arms. So that is how I relate to any other form of music. Every time my mind does the translating for me and then I just start improvising. Hmm. But yes, one thing I keep in mind is uh, I try to hear what the other person is doing. Sure. Because when you are collaborating with somebody mentally, you should be in it together, right? You should understand each other. Otherwise, you will be doing something. He'll be doing something with no connection in in between the music. Sure. And how was it like for you to be working with such a legend? I mean, like, what was the experience of working with him? I didn't know it was a legend. Oh, you didn't know. Thank God. <laughs> okay. Probably. Wow. Uh, nervous or uh, what is it overwhelmed but I right. know much about him so you just thought he's some random guy from LA not random guy I uh, my brother and my cousin they all told me like you don't know who Ray Manzarek is and all I said no <laughs> <laughs> my god my yeah. god wow really this has been um... so I, I actually asked him have you heard of Ray Manzarek of the Doors? Like, you didn't know who the Doors were either. Are, kya baat hai? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so wow, wow. 
that's when i came to walls until then i so yeah i just went and played something <laughs> <laughs> fantastic so uh if anybody has any questions i will take them we will take them once uh we is done playing we please we are eagerly waiting for you to just what play a play that is question <laughs> huh what do i play a uh, violin i know but what in violin <laughs> i don't know whatever you want but i will have to shift my uh just hold on one second this set up because my phone is going to die <laughs> Can you see? Yes, I can see. So I'll just play a composition, hmm. which is in, uh, which I composed. Okay. Okay. In. Ah. Uh, huh? Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. the rag is jokons aha and i have made a composition in uh, rupak okay i am going to play that so
Sorry, it's my mom. <laughs> I pranam to her. Pranam to her. I can't. One thing. I've never heard you play this rag. This is one of my favorite rags, and there's a very talented singer who is watching right now, Rajdeep Mukherjee. He's also saying that it's his favorite rag, one of his favorite rags. So this is my composition. This is fantastic. Bibi, I cannot wait to uh, play with you and for this lockdown to get over and, you know, just sit on stage and do what we do again. And, yes. uh, you know, there is a, a thing that I wanted to um, tell you, which is that uh, we have uh, two album recordings which are still unreleased of me and you playing together. Uh, which one? I don't even remember. 
This is the day before we played at the Dover Lane conference. We recorded two albums in Kolkata. Oh, remember, God. you played Puriya Dhanashri, and uh, one was Puriya Dhanashri, and the other one was um, Jog, I think. Okay. And we so, should and, get, yeah. get it. Yeah, soon. We should put it out because that is uh, it's golden what you played, and this was right the day before we played at Dover Lane. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, everybody who's watching, we will uh, make a plan and we will release this uh, recording for you guys to share. And yes. Vicky, thank you so much for, for spending this time with me and uh, sharing such wonderful insights, such amazing amount of knowledge. And I'm, I'm truly honored. And again, um, this has been a wonderful, wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, take care and please stay safe. Don't, don't go out. Yeah, don't yeah up with you and yeah. good luck to you and hopefully we'll play soon absolutely we're really looking forward yeah really looking forward. yeah pranam, pranam to you. bye bye um i will just uh a quick announcement before i end this um my next guest is going to be indrayud majumdar the sarod player um, son of the illustrious uh, Tejinder Nana and Rajinder Ji that will be on the 17th and I have a host of really amazing interviews lined up for you guys um, which I'm really really looking forward to bringing the guest after that uh, will be um, Anubrata Bhai and then Pandit Tarun Bhattacharya will be with us so uh, please watch this space please follow Kalaji please follow Kalaji her insta handle is the singing violin which is truly uh, what her violin is. She makes the violin sing. So the singing violin. Rajdeep, thank you uh, uh, for joining. All of you who joined, thank you for joining. And I will be back again on Wednesday with another episode of the Unlock Channel. Thank you so much. And I love you all. <laughs>